Welcome to At Work in America, sponsored by Paychex. At Work in America digs in behind the headlines and trends to the stories of real people making a difference in the world of work. And now, here are your hosts, Steve Bowes and Trish Steed. Welcome to the At Work in America podcast. My name is Steve Bowes. I'm joined by Trish Steed. Trish, what's happening? You know, it's a good day here. It is not too hot, not raining. I don't know. How are things where you are? Uh, fantastic. Hot, 97 degrees today as Ooh. we record this. Uh, after the show, I think I'm going to get outside and do something. So, oh, my uh, goodness. But yeah, it's uh, great. Summertime. We're uh, Fall is coming quickly, though. Sadly, we spent a little bit of time uh, <laughs> earlier this week talking about events and travel, and oh. it's shocking trish for someone who at least for me who said i don't want to travel so much anymore right for work i really don't <laughs> it's stunning how much travel there's coming up but i guess we'll talk about that on another uh, at another time um yeah the new normal that that came about supposedly during the pandemic that's gone right we're back to how it was so yeah i think i've got like 11 or 12 trips this fall it's ridiculous it's too many one uh, Fun, fun trips, but it's yeah. Not. And speaking of fun, good segue. Uh, let's set up today's show real quick because today's show that uh, we just finished recording is fantastic. And probably really you is. you just said a, a second ago this is one of your favorites of the year, uh, and I think it's probably one of mine too, Trish. We're going to be talking about uh, yeah. volunteerism, faith based leadership, and getting more involved in the community with the CEO uh, and president of Volunteers of America Colorado, Mr. Dave Shunk. And Trish, what a wonderful guy and fantastic conversation. Yeah, I think what people are hopefully going to take away from this is it is definitely possible to get involved in any capacity with your community outreach. Um, and if you don't have that connection, then Volunteers of America Colorado will absolutely be a great connection for you and your company. Yeah, and, and I encourage everybody to check this out. It's a great conversation. It, it, look, you don't have to be in Colorado either to get like a no. lot out of this conversation. But um, right. yeah, if you are, I encourage you to listen as well. But uh, so that's coming up. We must thank our friends at Paychex, of course, Trish. Of course, uh, this episode is sponsored by Paychex, one of the leading providers of HR, payroll, retirement, and insurance solutions for businesses of all sizes. Paychex, Trish, has created yet another fantastic resource for the community. It's called mm -hmm. The Essential Guide to Finding and Keeping Your Dream Team to Help Organizations with Attracting High-Quality Employees, Keep Them Engaged, Motivated, Retained. There's lots of strategies in there from benefits design, new technology, automation, and all these things that are important to employees to help them with their career growth, improve things like your onboarding process, how do you manage flexibility, right, in the modern workplace, mm -hmm. which so many employees want. So this is a great resource, free to the community. You don't have to be a Paychex client, but you can access this at paychex.com slash A-W-I-A. That's P-A-Y-C-H-E-X dot com slash A-W-I-A and unlock the secret of building your dream team today. Good stuff from Paychex, of course. Of course. All right, Trish. This is going to be a great show. Let's get Dave on and talk about volunteering, being active in the community, and connecting to a mission. It's a fantastic conversation, and let's welcome him. We are excited to welcome our guest today. He is Dave Schunk. He is the president and CEO of Volunteers of America Colorado, we're going to talk about faith-based leadership, the mission of the nonprofit, how organizations and people can be more involved in their communities. I, I can't wait to have this conversation. Let's uh, look a little bit more about Dave, Trish. Uh, since late 2018, Dave has served in his position at the Volunteers of America Colorado, a faith-based nonprofit human services organization. Away from the office, he serves on several ministry, business, and community boards. He loves the outdoors, which makes sense for being in Colorado. Colorado. And, and his <laughs> church community. And he's married with three grown children and enjoys, of course, his grandchildren. I don't know how many, Dave. You'll have to tell us how many grandchildren there are. Okay. Dave, welcome to the show. Great to see you. How are you? I am wonderful. What a great opportunity. And thank you for having me, Trish and Steve. 
it, it's our pleasure. Um, we were so excited. We talked a little bit in the pre-show uh, before we started the show about uh, how excited we are to talk to you about the mission to learn more about Volunteers America Colorado and your story too, Dave. Like because we've, I, I think back to a recent show we did with Keith Wargo, who's the president of Autism Speaks, right? And mm -hmm. we, you know, before he got into that work in that community and serving the neurodiverse community and the autism community, he had a really interesting kind of corporate life and background too. And it's always interesting to us to learn more about the people we meet with and how they sort of came to be where they're at. So maybe Dave, if you don't mind, we'll start there. Let's learn a little bit more about you and how you sort of came to be uh, the president of Volunteers America in Colorado, because you don't wake up one day and, and that's your job, right? <laughs> Well, and if you would have asked me 35, 40 years ago, would I have ended? I would have said, no, there's not a possibility. But, and I think, let me preface this by saying, I think in a person's career, they can bring their whole self, their faith component to any job. And, 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 I, and in my faith, in the Christian faith, I'm called to do that. I was not very good at it. Um, I tried to figure it out in a number of different ways. I was in banking and technology uh, for a number of years. I love that space. Banking, you meet a lot of incredible people. Uh, I then went with a customer that I was actually banking who had just come out of bankruptcy in the technology space, and that was a phenomenal experience. And then from there, I went into some other businesses, private equity. And all through that journey, uh, while it was wonderful, there were some, there were some missing components for me. One, I was on the road a lot, and I was uh, missing some formative years in my family. And our faith, uh, my wife's and my faith, have always been an integral part of that. And that was missing. I was gone a lot. And so for me, that was difficult. And the same thing, as I said earlier, I really struggled uh, bringing that whole self to the work uh, environment. And back in the 80s and 90s, there was, it was an easier time when you could do that mm -hmm. uh, versus today. It's a little more difficult, and maybe we can talk about that. Yeah. So long, moving the story along just a little bit quicker. Um, in, uh, in, in, in the early 2000s, 2005, 2006, a good friend of mine, and this is one of my, my life themes, if you will, or messages to those out there, relationships matter. Yeah. Who you're connected to and who you're not connected to really defined who you are over time. And one individual that I was connect, connected to by pure chance in the banking business, a guy by the name of Brad Miley, Brad uh, eventually became the CEO of Denver Rescue Mission. And for years, he asked me to join his board Finally, after a number of no's and no's, he was persistent. I said, yes, I joined his board in 2005. And then that changed my life. Wow. That, uh, that board experience where I got to see two things. I saw lives change uh, for the good. I also saw failure. And I saw a lot of it in this space, in the human services space, for those listening that know, um, humans are very complex. Yeah. And you, know, you might get one in 10 or one in eight or something like that that might ultimately change their trajectory of their life permanently, you'll get four to five of those 10 that will change your life for a period of time, a season. And when you see that, it's just tremendous. And then there's times that those that don't, but then they come back for a second and a third chance. And that's what I loved yeah. is that second and third chance for those individuals and for those that succeeded. So with that part of the journey done between 05 and 10, I was still in the private world with a foot in the nonprofit faith-based space. And by 2011, a CFO job opened up at Denver Rescue Mission for me. And uh, it was funny. The CEO, Brad, came to me and said, hey, do you know any good CFOs? <laughs> they, they, and it, well, this is funny. I, I said, no, I, I mean, I, I'm oh, no. not that interested, but I know a few. And I, he said, hey, that was on a Friday. On a Monday, he said, All right, let's go have breakfast on Monday. I made the big mistake. Actually, the greatest thing I ever did was go home and tell my wife about it. She said, uh -uh. Let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. We actually, for me, we prayed and we fasted and we we just really thought through this because I had three kids in college. Wow. And, uh, I just like, I already, I was on the finance committee. I already knew what the CFO made at Denver Rescue Mission at the time. Mm -hmm. And I just said, how are we going to do this? And she said, we got to have faith. And yeah. we did. Anyway, long story short, I went and told him I was interested. He said, no way, you'll get bored. You've done all these amazing things. I said, Brad, I really haven't. I'm not being fulfilled. Yeah. And, um, I take a lot of that inspiration from this uh, book by Bob Buford. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's uh, the book title is something to the effect of uh, success to significance. Okay. And, and so uh, that really drove me at that point in my career. I really, not that I had tons of success. I had plenty of failure, <laughs> plenty <laughs> of failure, but I really felt like I had satisfied that, that business component. I felt like I had a lot to bring to the nonprofit space. And that's yeah. what inspired me to make the jump 
have some faith, do some real estate investing to help uh, bridge the financial gap. And uh, it's worked out. And now I feel like I'm in the best job ever. Seven years at DRM, then the rescue mission. Um, and then uh, uh, Brad actually came down the hallway, my good friend and mentor. And he said, you know what? I can't believe I'm doing this. But I feel like I'm being nudged by a higher power. And you need to go talk to my good friends at VOA to be their next CEO. And I said, I like it here. He said, I'm, I'm kicking you out. I'm like the mama <laughs> bird the nest. And he did. And, uh, and then this has been a tremendous journey. Not easy, but a yeah. tremendous journey. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I mean, I'm frantically making notes for anyone who's just <laughs> listening to the, the pure audio version of this. Um, so many things to unwrap and unravel in that story that <laughs> that really speak to what we hear from an HR perspective, right? From from employees every day, trying to figure out where is the right place to work, especially if you're maybe just entering the workforce or maybe you've been at a company for a while and now you've been downsized and now you're sort of like, what do I do next? I I just have to say, I love that your path to where you are today isn't a straight line, right? And one of the things that I know, I, I currently have kids in college, Steve has as well, and, and many of our listeners do as well. Um, it's something that you get asked all the time when you have children that are grown ups that are, you know, still searching themselves like, well, how do you find the right job, right? I loved what you said when you said that the relationships matter. Because to me, when you're making relationships and just focusing on that, I sort of believe that God will put the right opportunity in your path. And it sounds like I was just, I was so intrigued that conversation with your wife. Um, can you talk just a little bit about that? Maybe even from the perspective of younger people trying to figure out their path. What role do you think that plays in just being open to what is placed before you? Or or is that important? Oh, Trish, you're, you're hitting a really important topic. It is important. It absolutely is. And I think uh, for me, I, I needed to just um, hear from my partner um, of her support because this was a sacrifice for her. She actually went back to work, but she was so mm -hmm. excited to do that. She wanted to contribute. And we were at a good point. Our kids were now out of the house in college. Uh, actually, our last one was a, a senior at Valor High School, which here in Denver, you might know, that's equal to a college tuitions, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe more, but it was worth <laughs> it. But I guess the point is, is that they were really pretty much all, already, you know, on that independence track. And so she had that time, she was able to do that. But it was her encouragement that said, you know what, I need to make this jump, because I knew, for me, there was a hole in my heart, there was a hole in my, uh, mm -hmm. career. I felt like I was missing something. And I won't get too much into scripture. But let me just say this one, and it's a really good one. And it says, uh, Paul actually states in the New Testament, he just states that to live a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. And that is my life verse. And I felt like I had not been in the calling I was destined to be. I felt like um, that there needed to be that. And yet there was this financial gap and some other things. And so a couple messages I would say, relationships do matter. That was critical. I don't think I ever would have made that jump without key mentors in my life. So I would tell young people, the people you're working with now, even if you're not in the job that you, you ultimately will be in or the career, and by the way, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Things have changed so much from when my father was in the workforce and from even today and my over my 40 years, the, the being in that same vertical career path, that's really changed. I, we don't, in fact, some of that can, can be even negative. So we look at that, but, but relationship matters. So the people you're working with Work your best, work your hardest, be known as the person that raises their hand and says, I'll do that. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Have that can do attitude because people remember that. They don't remember specifically what you said or you know, details like that. They do remember how you made them feel. And I think in Brad's case, we, we, there was a, a 20 year separation between he and I in that space. And while we kept in touch a little bit, is what he remembered how I made him feel. Mm -hmm. And I certainly remembered how he made me feel. And so number one, be relationship matter. And the second one is I would tell people, live under your means. So if your means allow you to live at position A, whatever that is, don't live there. Buy the smaller house, drive the car a little longer, uh, look for ways to save money. You know, it's the millionaire next door theme, right? Where you can save a little bit at a time and really do that. If, if you can live under your means, and be satisfied there, you now have flexibility. Right. And mm -hmm. if I had not done that, and trust me, <laughs> I was the bad end of this one, um, you know, right, right before the Great Recession, I'm like, honey, we need to move to a bigger house. I'm tired of this. <laughs> I'm buying 
you know, it's like hashtag first world problems, right? Yeah. Right. The garage is too small. Wah, you know? Yeah. I can't fit she, my jet ski in the garage. Exactly. Right, right. right. And right. so she says, no, and she says, no, we're staying here. I love this community. We're going to stay in this. And I knew she was right. But by, by living under your means, you have now lots of flexibility when opportunities present themselves and opportunities will present for young people, especially when you look at demographics and the job openings that will be coming up in leadership positions. Plus, if you've garnered relationships that matter throughout your time, you're going to have opportunities. You can't take those if, however, you've lived above your means. Because now financially, you've got to really figure that one out. And that's hard. Yeah. Great yeah. advice. And you know what? I don't think in all the years we've done this for 15 years, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that that is actually a key to flexibility is living under your means. And it's so wise. So thank you for sharing that. That's really good advice. Yeah. And I think another interesting thing we're tapping into here a little bit, uh, Dave, uh, I think, is how... Look, it's real easy for people sometimes to say, even people like us, to say, oh, you know, find your passion, connect to work you're really passionate about, find that right fit. Look, so many people in the working world, in our country, you, look, your passion is paying the rent and feeding your family, right? That's your passion. Yeah. That's what you've got to do. You don't maybe have that luxury to really seek out and find that that just right fit or that that place that aligns with we see this a lot in the surveys of younger workers entering the workforce today, actually, too, where they really are looking for that values alignment and that connection to a mission, which, Dave, you're, you're, you're explaining to, to us how valuable that's been to you personally, certainly, and professionally, too. And that, but that's not always easy to do and uh, because practicality, right? You've got to keep the lights on and keep the family fed and all that. Um, but I think you're really tapping into... If you can do it, it by a combination of being patient and forging relationships, living a little bit beneath your means, as you described, Dave, that you can maybe have the better opportunity, right, to find those, whether it's, it doesn't have to be in the nonprofit world, it can be in other types of work too, but uh, I, I think you're tapping into just how much more fulfilled you can be as a person if your work really lines up with your values. I, I think you'd probably agree with me on that, Dave. Oh, it's 100 percent. Yeah. But I'd also say, Steve, very quickly, too, and I just touched on that earlier, I do believe people can find um, worth and value in their current job, even if it's, you know, maybe they're, they're, the, the mission of the company might be selling widgets, right? Yeah, you're, maybe you're okay. working in the Amazon warehouse and doing exactly. fulfillment, right? You, you can still find worth in that. And here's where you do that, two ways, I believe. I wasn't particularly good at it. And that's why for, for me, my path ventured this way. And I'm so fortunate that it did. But I think a lot of people do this where uh, you're in a spot um, and you're say in the Amazon warehouse, not to pick on Amazon, but right. let's do that for fun in the sense, because it could be anywhere. And you're in that spot and there's people around you and there's people. And we talked about this just a minute ago before we came on air. There's people in need all around you. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a good friend of mine, a mentor say to me, Everyone we meet every day has something they're dealing with. We're all pretty good about hiding it. I am too, but they're dealing with something in their life and you can impact that. And one of the things that, that Volunteers of America has taught me and that we really preach here is that a simple engagement can change a life. A simple engagement of seeing somebody, being present with them, it can be a hello, but a real hello. So that's one, is that kind of presence in the workplace where you can change people's lives just by the people around you there. And then the second thing, and I tell young people this all the time, get involved with your cause yeah. on, a, on a voluntary basis, whatever that cause is. It could be uh, an animal shelter. It can be, we would love to have you at BOA. We have 16,000 volunteers that we work with uh, to keep up our mission. But get involved in your spare time. In fact, get on a board, on a nonprofit board. Nonprofit mm -hmm. boards need, nonprofits need business acumen. They need marketing. They need finance skills. They And you can do that on a voluntary basis, and that can also help um, uh, you get opportunities. Because guess who else is on that board? Other influential people. Right. That you, meet. Mm -hmm. so you gain opportunities. You also get to share what you've been given, and that's a worthwhile uh, experience in, in itself. Yeah, I think those – one thing I, I'm just consistently hearing from you is there are so many steps that – all of us can take that are going to, again, even if you're not in that maybe right position today, start taking some of those steps, right? There, there are two or three very actionable things you, you mentioned. Um, 
I'd like to delve a little bit, though, into actually what it is that you're doing at um, Volunteers of America Colorado, and so that people who are listening can both sort of identify, you know, what it is that you're doing, and then why that is so special and different, and maybe how they can get more involved. So if you just take a couple minutes, maybe tell us a little bit about your work and what that means to the communities you're serving. Yeah, Trish, thank you for that opportunity. I'd love to do that. I get to do that every day, and it's mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. But we are a uh, faith-based Colorado uh, institution. We do affiliate with the National Organization, Volunteers of America. The, the VOA story is fascinating. The very, very short version is we were part of Salvation Army in 1896. We split. The, the son had come over from England and uh, had done so well with the Salvation Army here in 1896 to not to eighteen to to the year nineteen hundred that the that uh, it grew faster than the England one and then Dad came over and said hey we're going to pull you back he said no we love it here we've become Americans we want to grow this so they just had a friendly split we still work closely side by side with Salvation Army every day mm-hmm. but that's how our start and that's where our faith uh, journey began and and they'll so through that today Colorado we serve over one hundred six thousand Coloradoans every every day uh, we do that through four primary means. We, the two that are basic are hunger services. So we um, do meal, we run the lar- one of the nation's largest Meals and Wheels program. And then we have food operations that we serve through our shelters and our transitional housing and our affordable housing. So food is key. And then housing is key. We're one of the state's largest affordable housing providers. We have 27 affordable housing communities called wow. communities for a reason. And then we have a number of shelters. So those, these are emergency shelters that are focused on populations that are underserved. Uh, the Denver Rescue Mission and Catholic Charities, God bless them, they're serving big groups, of, especially rescue mission of men. But we're focused more on, for example, women 55 and older that are experiencing homelessness. So shelter, mm-hmm. transitional housing, and affordable housing. Now, we use those two things to help us gain a relationship, a trusted relationship with our, the person that we're serving. And then the magic happens, right? We believe that food is an opportunity at a relationship, and a relationship is an opportunity at a transformed life. So that's the opportunity to get to transform. And so the other two parts that what we do are community support and volunteer. So this is where we change lives. This is where we're connected to people. A number of great programs. It could be a, we have a handyman program for seniors who can't fix up mm-hmm. their house. So we do that for free, and we get volunteers to come in and do that. One of my favorites is the foster grandparent program. I read about that one, Dave, this morning. Yeah. I was Isn't gonna, that amazing? Yes, I did. That was so cool. Maybe you could describe that one briefly. I will. Yeah. It gives me chills to talk about it because I can yeah. think of a couple of our foster grandparents who are just so precious. But these are uh, men and, and women that have been part of our American community for the longest time. And they're seniors. They have no family members, most of them. They live by themselves. They're isolated. They're lonely. So we reach out to them. We know they have skills. I think in America, we quickly discard our seniors um, and you know they, they ha- have a purpose of being friendly, but they have so much more to give. And so we reach out to these seniors who are uh, typically living right on the edge of poverty and we bring them in, we train them, we actually pay them a small stipend and then we put them in the inner city schools of Denver and Aurora. And now you have a grandparent in the classroom. The teachers love it because they can focus on teaching and the important things they do. And the grandparent, get, the foster grandparent gets to do what grandparents do. Be a little goofy. I'm learning that. <laughs> my three new grandkids. Uh, you'd be a little bit goofy, but you're safe. And you all provide the kids an opportunity with another uh, person to just encourage them and let them become who they're worthy of becoming. And uh, it's one of our favorite programs. And yeah. that's what we were talking about, Steve. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. And you think like, you know, for some of those folks, the grandparents I'm, I'm thinking of specifically, they might feel a little isolated. Maybe they're not contributing anymore in any way. And this gives them something to look forward to, something to add value to. And that, that it's a win-win all around. That's It's so innovative. Yeah. All the way around it. And I think about the same with our Meals and Wheels program. So you take our food services and we mm-hmm. say here often, again, we did a million, 1.4 million meals last year statewide. And all of our volunteers, I have so many stories I could share with you, but uh, the stories are, we say, it's about the food, but it's not about the food, right? It's about that connection that happens that when we when we have our Meals and Wheels volunteer, they'll knock on the door and the person will come. Oftentimes, it's the only person they're going to see all week. 
because wow. these, these are homebound seniors and mm -hmm. we want them to stay in their home, but then we also want to have connection because yeah. that's what helps people thrive. And so not only is it a help to society and you can go through all the cost reasons and all that, but more importantly, it allows people to age in dignity and connection. And, mm -hmm. and so this volunteer will come up, they'll hand the food and they'll say, how you doing today? Let's, mm -hmm. you know, and many of them know the story because they're serving the same people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's just, a, it's a, I think it's one of the best government programs. A lot of government programs, maybe not so good. Mm -hmm. This one is great because it involves what everyone does best. Uh, government acquires the food for us at a great price, nutritional food. We now work it and manage the food process. We have a big uh, 55,000 square foot kitchen here in Commerce City. And so we get that food ready. And then we organize the volunteers. We have 800 volunteers who help us deliver these routes every day. And it's the last mile connection to people that the government says, hey, you do that. Right. You do, the, you do what a community should do. And that, I mean, I'm telling you, it works wonders. We just have so many beautiful uh, stories from that. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, D Dave, I'd, I'd like to ask you, now you're in Colorado there in the Denver area and then, out, you know, other places in Colorado. In the last five, six years, are are the demand for these services is it going up are you are you doing more and more every year is it is it is starting to feel like hey we're, 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 it's get, it's getting a little bit ch maybe even challenging to keep up with the need in the community such a great question steve the need is greater than ever uh i always tell people it's a little bit like a a, a sink or a basin and you have the faucets on but you have the drain open mm -hmm. and you know we're getting people out of homelessness and we're getting food insecurity handled but it seems like more come in in Colorado, as you guys know, we have we've had a significant increase in the migrant population, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but we still have fundamental issues across America and in Colorado with fentanyl and and uh, other you know fact factors causing homelessness, the cost of housing. Yeah, all these things are still producing that. I mean, education is a factor. You know, and and the, even Barack Obama said this several back in two thousand eight, where you look at education and you look at uh, marriage. You know, these are big factors for keeping people out of homelessness, and those uh, those aren't moving the right way. But we still see, in fact, this is an interesting statistic, uh, one in seven Coloradoans um, uh, deal with food insecurity every every day. And that's defined wow. simply as the decision made between paying, say, a utility bill and putting food on the table. That's one in seven. And for veterans in Colorado, that's one in four. So 25% oh, wow. of our veterans, those that have served our country, and veterans are one of the biggest populations we serve, that and seniors are our two biggest, and um, uh, it's a big issue. So food insecurity is a bigger problem, is, is growing. Um, you wouldn't think it would with being the most uh, you know, wealthy nations in the world, uh, you wouldn't think, but it is. And so, Stephen, the second question is homelessness, and you guys have heard the stories there uh, for all the reasons I said earlier. We yeah. continue to see that. So one of our big Program, a number of our programs are a rapid rehousing program where we work with uh, veterans and others experiencing homelessness. We get them into housing. We stand in between, say, um, a landlord and the tenant and help them. And we bring case management around them to help them get to a position where they can do that on their own. Our whole goal is to get them independent, self-sufficient. And that could be physically, mentally, and spiritually. We do have a, a ministry that helps them mm -hmm. spiritually if they want it. Sure. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. Trish made a really great. Yeah, comment. you got you serve everyone in the community. It's not, there's not some litmus right. test of no. you must be a veteran or you must be nope. a senior nope. or you must be a certain faith. There's none of that, right? None of that. Everyone and nope. any, anyone served. No questions asked. If you are of faith and if you desire that, we'll provide that. But we do not. I think it's a really unique thing that we do here at VOA. Uh, we uh, the VOA organization actually organizes a church. But our employees do not have to take a faith statement. There's no requirement there. Mm -hmm. So we have, we're very diverse. We're very mm -hmm. wide. And we've had to learn how to navigate that. And yeah. I really feel like the culture here, we haven't done it perfect, but I feel like we've uh, really, really, our, our focus in our ministry is really on serving those in need, period. Yeah. In fact, it's even called ministry of service. And mm -hmm. I think that's one way we've been able to work it where you can bring your faith but as, uh, what is it, Francis Assisi once said, preach often and only rarely use words. <laughs> it's by our actions, right? It's by our yeah. actions that we do that. So if we're acting and loving on people, caring for them, 
uh, doing that in a, in a, uh, in a sacrificial way, that speaks plenty. Yeah. And that's where we focus. Yeah. I'm glad that you share that because I think that so often in the workplace, especially in the for-profit part of the world, um, we've sort of come to a time where you're really not supposed to talk about religion at work, right? Or politics or any or anything that's going to be divisive potentially. But I, what I find intriguing is that you're sort of telling us how you can do that by creating a culture where there are many ways to show that faith through service, right? I, I worked for a nonprofit myself and it, we were all about servant leadership, right? And go. I sort of see that's what you're doing, right? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If if I'm an HR leader or a CEO even or another C-suite member and I'm listening to this episode and I'm thinking, wow, we've kind of shied away from letting people be their whole selves at work. What are some easy ways they can kind of start tweaking their culture to make people of faith feel like they're able to have moments to share that? Are, are there any tips you have for that or... You know we do, it, and it, it's it's an interesting uh, thing. We've we've had to kind of find our way, navigate our way to this. A couple things. One is in our culture, we do have it's in our po- policy, and we do practice it. it. It's actually a Patrick Lencioni theme, and it's the ideal team player, and it's called hungry, humble, and smart. Mm-hmm. And in these three components, he teaches these virtues where it's the balance of the three, and so that's one of our culture items that allows us to uh, bring these things in in a, in a safe manner. I think two is um, we do allow people to put personal expressions of whatever it is. Again, we're a Christian background organization, but we do allow, I mean, it can be anything that the only, there is a couple of rules around it. Uh, one of them is, is that as long as it's not anything violent or degrading another faith. So somebody mm-hmm. can have a, say a Buddhist or a, a Muslim, and we have that representation in their office or their cube space. That's totally fine. It's totally fine because it's who they are, or it could be it could be something else. It could be a, an expression of the of the rainbow, the pride flag, whatever it might be. Again, that's their personal expression, so we do allow that. In the public spaces, we keep those free of those kind of things. So mm-hmm. in the bill, the bulletin boards that you guys are HR people, you know, we have all the HR related mm-hmm. stuff. You need that's to right. have, have all that up. We have anything else going on. We have birthdays, we have anniversaries, we celebrate all that stuff. But really, we try to keep anything related to, um, I don't know, anything that could be divisive, we keep out mm-hmm. of the public space, which we also carry that out to, and we, we adopted this from Vanderbilt. Uh, and this would be one message I would say to CEOs and those out there, and it may work for some and it may not work, but Vanderbilt has a policy they called institutional neutrality. And what that means for the outward expression, so uh, the outward expression of VOA Colorado if it's anything within our core box, so if it has to do with veterans, we'll advocate for veterans. If it has anything right. to do with older or mm-hmm. with seniors, we're on our pedestal saying, hey, help us. We want to help them and blah, blah, blah. But if it's anything else, right, no matter where you come from, um, you know, we, we really shy away from any of the big uh, social issues of the day, any of those kind of things from a public perspective. And while yeah. sometimes employees say, hey, I wish you would have done more here or there, they also understand that that works two ways. We also encourage our employees, take off your VOA Colorado shirt and go do whatever advocacy you want to do outside of work. We, In fact, we'd love for you to do that because that's the American way. Yeah. And it's yeah. not always, sometimes we get some complaints about that, but I, I think generally it's the way to navigate through. And we're seeing some of the big corporations do that. We're seeing... Yeah. Some, uh, you see John Deere and we see some others that are starting to say, you know, look, that's for individual, but from a corporate side and same with us as an agency, if I were to take a stand, if we were to take a stand on a policy, about 50% of my donors and about 50% of my clients <laughs> serve would be upset. Yeah. The others would be really happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, no, the, not veterans or not, you know, homelessness, then uh, really that's where we're going to stay. In yeah. Our it, it, it's a compelling uh, argument, Dave, for just kind of focusing on the mission, right? Why are we here? We are here exactly. to serve veterans, to serve seniors, to to help people with homelessness. We are here to make sure people aren't going hungry, right? That's why we're here. And exactly. let's keep that our focus and our mission in which and hopefully is what John, I don't know exactly, Dave, how many uh, full-time staff you've got at, at VOA, but you've got a number of them who 
most of them I'm imagining were drawn similarly to how you were drawn there, right? To, to, do, to serve in, the, in those capacities. Yeah, we've got 420 employees throughout the state in 42 locations. Yeah. And they, they are the most hardest, I mean, they're incredibly hardworking employees. Uh, of the 400 plus that we have, about 150 of them are true cache management frontline staff. Wow. And uh, these are the most amazing individuals. They, uh, they, they're on the front line. They're seeing, you know, they're seeing the fentanyl and the other tough stuff that, that folks experiencing homelessness are dealing with. They see sometimes the violence and they see sometimes the, uh, all the downside of the human spirit and the human nature, but they are amazing folks. And we just want to encourage them and we need more of that, that spirit um, and help them out any way we can. And so we work hard on our compensation programs for that. Well, for everybody, but sure. especially for the group and, um, yeah. and also keeping them safe. Yeah. 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 You have um, so many ways that people can get involved and help. Um, what can organizations do? Maybe someone's listening and, and whether they're in a position where they can make this decision or not, or maybe they can be an influence to it. What can they do if they are either based in Colorado or have employees maybe just based in Colorado who they're kind of looking for something to get involved in and a way to give back to the community? How can they get involved with Volunteers of America Colorado or Volunteers of America if they don't have that Colorado connection? What's the best way for them to learn more? And oh, thanks active? for the question, Trish. Yeah, so the remember the four things we do. We do housing, we do hunger, and that engages now, allows us to do community support services. And then the other one is volunteers. It's in our name. We believe so much in the volunteer, what it does for the volunteer, and then also what it does for the client. And so we have a number of different volunteer programs. We have a fully uh, staffed and, and a director level led volunteer leader. And their whole job is to come alongside corporations or individuals that want to have a, an experience, a volunteer experience, safe, but yet um, uh, huge in their developmental and their exposure to what it is. So whether it's a specially designed program or just uh, uh, helping serve at one of our uh, shelters, that's there. We have a number of corporations to do. We have, you know, I can name a bunch of them, banks and private corporations and developers and government entities. And here's what's great about it. A lot of them will come in and do a, say, a half day of service. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, by the way, we handle groups from three, three, it could be a three employee, a little branch outfit, say, Somewhere we can handle that all the way. We just had a huge group in a um, uh, resort services uh, hospitality entity come in, well known here in Colorado, great company. And they they brought eighty, so we had eighty. People. Oh wow! And we put them in different facilities, and then they all came back together. And this happens a lot. And they, they get one of our conference rooms or a space, and then they talk about their experiences. And I mean, you can see team bonding ha happen. Uh, people feel yeah. good about what they do. They're helping those in need. They're helping us. Uh, we had uh, over 200,000 uh, volunteer hours last year. That's hours otherwise we would have had to pay uh, additional staff for. So in and, and, uh, and this business, it's margins are tight. So this yeah. is so helpful to us as well. But it's great for the person in the corporation. Team bonding, retention. We think it helps retention mm -hmm. and, and uh, just the opportunity to do some good in the community. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd encourage everyone, whether you're in Colorado, certainly to connect with VOA Colorado or to look for these kinds of opportunities mm -hmm. in your local area. We've we've been fortunate enough, Trish, to work with some of our partners who do wonderful uh, things in the community, but there's certainly opportunity to do more. And I, I was thinking about this as we're, you know, the show will post in a, whenever, a week or so, and we're getting into the fall and then we're starting to close in on yeah. winter <laughs> and mm -hmm. holiday season and things like that. And it's, it's it's really a time where organizations and individuals can really should be really thinking about hey what can we do can, can we do more and I think the answer is typically yes you can do more but with with organizations like VOA Colorado like they they're there to help you right if you don't know where to go and where to start like you had eighty volunteers from that one organization Dave but you guys were able to make that connection between those eighty individuals right. And the places yeah. where they were needed right away that day, right? And, and, and allow them to do great work. So I think making that connection so powerful and important. So uh, yeah, uh, lovely stuff, Dave. Uh, it's um, we love to we we love to give the uh, corporation publicity. They go onto their social media and they can yeah. see company A mm -hmm. is. You know, we do the big check thing and we do whatever it is mm -hmm. that uh, does that. So we have contact information. I'm happy to provide that for you. Yep. Um, for can I do that now? Yeah, absolutely, Dave. 
Sure. Uh, so, so if you are interested in volunteering or donating, because uh, that's very important for us, but especially just in this case, since we're talking about volunteering, you can reach us at 303-297-0408. Just ask about that. That's 303-297-0408. Or probably better these days, go to our website at voacolorado.org, voacolorado.org. There's a volunteer tab on there. It has list out the organizational contacts. You can email, you can call. I would say this, Steve, to your good point about coming into fall and then into the holiday season. If you're a corporation and you want to get involved with any number of people, do it earlier. Because once you get into holiday, I mean, it seems like people, and this is maybe a human tendency, between October and December, this is when they all want to do their volunteering. And it's great. <laughs> Problem is we run out of spots like everyone else. Yeah. But it's in the Januarys and Februarys, and it's even in the Septembers and Augusts when we're thinking about other things. Yeah. And a lot of open spots. We can design something special for you. It's easier for us to do that. Yeah, it makes sense. Encourage people to go early or or go after the holiday. But yeah, we'll still take you whenever we can get you. Love it, yeah. Dave. Thank you so much. Uh, I also love the idea of of when you were talking about the grandparent program. I mean, taking people who might be lonely and have certainly have skills and love and. Um, and things they can share with others. It's such a good way to get the seniors back involved in something important. You know, I have retired parents myself, and um, I'm certainly going to reach out to them and and give them an example. Like they, you know, they they don't want to just sit home, right? They want to go out and be involved in their communities. So if you're if you're at retirement or near retirement, and you're thinking about like, what am I going to do next? What a perfect opportunity. Yeah. You know, oh, we've got a number involved. of different, I just mentioned one program. There's so many yeah. others that, especially for seniors, that will take and employ the skill, skill sets you have. And it's a wonderful thing. It's yeah. a win-win for everybody. It's so much yeah. great stuff. I did spend some time on the website that Dave mentioned this morning, voacolorado.org. I'd encourage folks to check that out. Some great stories, some great personal stories. I read a few of them this mm-hmm. morning as well, about some of the individuals, uh, Dave, that your team's and your volunteers have helped and impacted and how it's changed their lives. Very moving stuff. And we could probably do in a whole nother hour on some of those <laughs> stories, but I'd encourage folks to check that out. So uh, Dave, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It's been a pleasure to meet you, learn about you, learn about the story and and really just be inspired by it, quite frankly, because that's mm-hmm. kind of my big takeaway here and inspired by what's possible and what we can all do to make a difference in our community. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Steve, Trish. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this and your questions are just wonderful and spot on. Really loved it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Trish, great stuff. I loved it. Great to see uh, what's happening in the community. And uh, I want to do more shows like this. I really do. So let's uh, let's continue these conversations. We'll put the links that Dave mentioned in the show notes, um, as well as ways you can get involved. And, and I hope many people take uh, listen to this show and, and, and really push themselves and their organizations to 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 do what they can, for sure. Because the need is there, as Dave said. The need is there. And, and it's and growing. Just, yeah. yeah. Right. All right. That's great right. stuff. All right, thanks. Trish, uh, we will let Dave go. Uh, thanks again to Dave. And uh, Trish, thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation. We remind everybody to check out all the show notes at hrhappyhour.net. And thanks to our friends at Paychex, of course, for all their support. Um, for our guest, Dave Shunk, for Trish Steve, my name is Steve Bose. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next time. And bye for now.